Horizon Zero Dawn was a weird game when I saw it for the first time. During the PS4 Pro stream on Twitch, Sony made bold claims about the way this game will set the benchmark of the future of what the PS4 and the PS4 Pro can do in terms of scale and quality. But I was at best skeptical. The most graphically intensive game so far on the PS4 that had impressed me at the time was Overwatch, achieving what most PC elitists would call neat. A near ultra experience running at a solid 60 frames per second for a game that was arguably small but well made for its size. The constant boasts of 4K rendering with HDR compatibility, as well as 1080p plus HDR for the standard PS4, felt like pipe dreams towards my expectations of the game. I was skeptical, as the lead engineer pitched techniques and the capabilities of the mid cycle console. This PS4 Pro had something to prove, and this game, developed by Guerrilla Games, a longtime partner of Sony, was the golden child to do just that. The train reading up to the release was overshadowed by the juggernaut that is Nintendo and the sheer amount of mystery that was the Switch. Not to mention the other onslaught of PS4 exclusives that came out during the first quarter of 2017. Gravity Rush 2, Neo, Yakuza 0, all receiving positive reviews, made the stage for the golden child of what the PS4 Pro could really deliver even more daunting. But Gorilla was determined. If anything, I had some expectations. Before playing Horizon Zero Dawn, I went ahead and played a few hours of the first game for the PS4, Killzone Shadowfall. A game mildly received, but undeniably pretty. It gave me some confidence that the Gorilla could do something special with the PS4 Pro, but that was yet to be seen. I purchased Horizon Zero Dawn on a whim, and I can point to a number of said factors leading to said whim. The game started to flex its muscles closer to release. More outlets began to write about the game, its proudness, its scale, the amount of things to do, and especially the graphical fidelity, proudly boasting levels of detail that would rival the sheer hyper-realism found in nature documentaries. It really began to slowly make a name for itself, and the train began to build up in speed. Reviews were spilling out as the embargo lifted. From performance reviews such as folks from Digital Foundry to opinionated sources from all sorts of journalists, the soundtrack began to trickle in bit by bit, establishing its own distinct melody, working to solidify itself as a game everyone should try. So I cracked. I went on Amazon, I bought the game disc to arrive on release day, never coming back from the office, shut off social media for the night, and started to play it. I knew a few things about the game. It's pretty, it's vibrant, the protagonist is likable and relatable to the point where some reviewers claim the player can really get invested in this character. I'm sure someone has claimed her as one of the best new female leads of this generation, say of all time. I wanted to come in relatively fresh and unbiased as I could be, but after seeing the reviews and the constant praise it received on Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, it was hard not to set lofty expectations. Nevertheless, after weeks of playing multiplayer games such as Overwatch and Destiny, I was ready to sit back and relax, take in a good story, and let myself get immersed in a world for once. I have a launch PS4, and seeing how much this game was touted for the Pro, I expected the visuals to be somewhat surpassed the fidelity and clarity found in Shadowfall. Since it was only for PS4, it had to basically run flawless, with only the minor hiccup here and there. I expected the world to be both vast and full of interesting secrets, yet also beckoning to be explored as you progress through the story and its many side quests. Judging those as fair expectations, a nice long immersion to the world of Zero Dawn for the 20 or 30 long hour campaign, a considerable well-priced experience, what I got was more. There is a huge difference between seeing and experiencing, especially content that is meant to be experienced. A great example of this is VR. Through a 2D screen on a mobile device, VR looks expensive, gimmicky, and even a bit of a hassle, as the asking price for a few hours of fun is too high to justify based off of someone else being jacked into the headset. But once you're in there, in the matrix, you get it. Everything makes sense. Everything is suddenly realized. It's the same with this game. 
The first hours of this game are fucking gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. To the point where I sat there scratching my head at my PlayStation 4, wondering how such a system can pump out some of the best visuals I've ever seen. It adds to the library of what exclusive content can do. Looking at examples such as The Last of Us on PlayStation 3, as well as Uncharted 4 on the PlayStation 4, these exclusive titles built specifically for Sony hardware truly push the limits of the console, and I heard those limits loud and clear due to how prevalent my console were during the initial load as well as some more intense battles. The character, Aloy, as a child, seemed inviting, naive, and utterly curious. Willing to throw caution into the wind to get the answer she wants, she's relatable, like that one friend who's egging you on to do something stupid because it'd be cool to see what happens next. Her personality extends more through her adult self as she hones her curiosity with the main premise of the story, discovering who she is, where she came from, and finding the answers to her questions. It's a great spirit, one that we don't see all the time portrayed, at least in my recent memory, and definitely adds to the initial pull of Aloy. Here's more. As the story unfolds, this theme of questions being answered with more questions does more to draw me in as a player. I begin to not only care about Aloy, but about the world itself, as it finally latches its grip onto me for the rest of the campaign. So let's break it down. There's a lot to discuss here in terms of the gameplay, the artistic direction, storytelling, and the design. A lot of the elemental choices made in this game do reflect the overall vision, but there are some pain points worth bringing up that interfere with the flow of the player. The graphical fidelity of this game is fucking insane. I've said it before and I'll say it again, these developers are true wizards of their craft. Its depiction of a post-post-apocalyptic earth shows both the grim history of the world towards its fall from grace and the beauty the natural world can still hold toward the user. The art direction in correlation with the narrative displays some sort of techno-utopia gone wrong, and in its place is this interesting mesh of nature and machine somehow coexisting. The landscape displays this vision the best. Stare off into the deep mountains of All Mother Meridian, and this interesting mesh of how Hades is fully one with the natural shaping of the mountain paints this picturesque snapshot of how the old world is fossilized and integrated into the current setting. It's a beautiful shot worth seeing from the height of a tall neck, as it parades round undeterred by its machine compatriots. It's not just the heights. The variety of biomes in this open world really flex the graphical fidelity of this game engine. No wonder Hideo Kojima chose this engine for Death Stranding. One of my favorite parts in this game is riding on the back of an overridden machine. Allowing me to traverse the landscape at a reasonable speed, I could take in the stride of nature as I gallop across different zones. Common elements of some familiar zones, such as stealth grass, more on that later, help maintain some familiarity as each biome presents its overall theme in tandem with the narrative. All Mother Mountain is temperate, Meridian boasts more lush climates, and the land of Shadow Karja banks on more barren elements. The cities and outposts are amazingly constructed, but also slightly conflicting. It may just be me, but wandering into the city of Meridian or the tribe of All Mother Mountain, I can't help but shake the feeling that everything feels vibrantly static, like a parade of colors stuck in limbo and only really receptive to my actions. It's a bit weird to grasp. Some more prominent open world games breathe life on all corners. Take Grand Theft Auto V for instance, where everywhere you turn, something interesting is happening. Sure, the game could be cheating creating instances of entertainment as you, the player, traverse certain areas of the map, but it's both passively and actively dynamic. It ignores the player, pulling them into the world as just another NPC, but can also shift on a dime to be reactive and receptive of the player, fully reacting to player actions, providing dynamic scenarios for the player to engage in. Static side quests of people lying on the side of a road or chilling out by the side of a rock don't really sell it for me. But hey, it's a start. I'll dive a bit deeper into side quests during my analysis of the story, but let's just say some had more love put into it than others. The whole package is something really amazing to hold on to. The world offers something for anyone with an eye for adventure. Whether that is looking for relics of the past, liberating an outpost Far Cry style, delving into cauldrons to boost your abilities, interacting with characters in cities in outposts, and smiting your enemies, it's all here. Quick rants on cauldrons, I love them. They're the best side quests in the game, hands down. They're not easily found, require a bit of puzzle solving to traverse, 
provide some of the most satisfying boss fights in this game that they have to offer. With real tangible rewards that make the future experience of the game very rewarding in the long run towards the end of the story. Ah, the story is quite a beast. At the time of writing this review, I'm about 75% of the way through the story, but part of me feels that's okay considering I still have a few mysteries to solve regarding Aloy, Zero Dawn, Gaia, and Hades. And the current mood of the story is that it's gripping. It's really gripping. Reviews of this game praise how interesting the story is and how the player can become invested, but offering a sense of time in which players can more or less expect to be drawn to, into the story and compelled to finish the adventure is definitely about 40 to 50%. The communications with the man in the focus silence, the constant theme of three steps forward, two steps back, all add to this overarching sense of mystery dominated by the wonder of the world itself. I've caught myself asking, huh, what's that in the distance? Is that a monster? Why is it embedded in the mountain like that? The funny thing is, the mysteries of the land can and will be solved, either by you or the story. The beauty of this open world is that there are no real restrictions, just soft walls. Want to grind your way up through the levels, solve all the side missions and content to blaze your way through the story in one fell swoop? You can do that. Explore the world at your own pace, discover the interesting mysteries tucked in. Can an outcast ever learn to be accepted? Because let's face it, Aloy has it real rough. No recollection of her past, raised by an outcast father figure who you get little to no exposition of why he left, and everyone basically hates you for no freaking reason. Kinda reminds me of current society in a way. It's funny because she basically reacts to this head on, and it resonated me in a way because I went on a mini monologue on how the game connected her frustration of being praised clashing with the knowledge that she was constantly reminded that she was an outcast the entire time. How can you expect the protagonist to accept these bouts of heaping praise? This moment, in tandem with the realization that just because your question is finally answered, albeit the solution was not one Aloy was quite looking forward to, is that this whole thing is much bigger than you. Her constantly clashing with the mystery man over their conflicting goals, only to sulkily realize that he was right all along, adds to the potential empathy I have as a player for Aloy. It's compelling. I started to care. Hard. I wanted to finish this game, to end this, to bring closure. It also helps the fact that, quote, I am the chosen, quote, has actual meaning and context to it, about why I can only do it. The reveal that Aloy is a reincarnate of Elizabeth serves mainly by reminders of the genetic identity scan, sells the player better than, hey, guess what? Ted over there? Yeah, he may or may not be able to slay a Thunderjaw like you, but it's only you that can save the world. Thanks, guy, I always knew that you believed in me. So yes, I like Aloy. She's definitely in the running for top female protagonists, surrounded by the likes of Samus Aran and Lara Croft. Let's cut the bullshit and just call it the best protagonist of 2017. Hades and the followers of the Sun God are interesting characters. A metallic mesh of subroutine functions turned sentient and aware, it's still embedded with the same primitive goals as before. Eradicate all organic life on Earth. Reminds me of a Ratchet and Clank antagonist, but 10 times edgier. Hades is a baller antagonist. Created as a part of Zero Dawn, his original purpose is to act as a dormant subroutine, capable of destroying all life on Earth via terraforming and machine commandeering, only to then return to sleep so Gaia can take over, reconstructing the biosphere for the next generation of humans. It's a weird addition to the suite, as acknowledged by the engineer in charge of the project, but hey, if it's necessary, it's necessary. Except it kinda isn't. See, what irks me is that the whole reason we arrived to the conclusion of Operation Enduring Victory and Project Zero Dawn is that the machines were infected with a virus that made them aware, but changed their directives to attack organic life rather than preserve it. And this was before Hades existed. So look, I get the reason Hades is a necessary subroutine of Gaia, but as a person who looks at this critically, this kind of antagonist only exists for the plot of it. In the real world, there would have been a safeguard against Gaia getting hacked and losing access to all of her subroutines, as well as Hades becoming sentient and fully desynchronized from the rest of the other facilities in Zero Dawn. But hey, that's just me thinking critically. Don't mind me. Then we come to Helis. 
Aw man. Poor Helis. A fanatic consumed by religion, he refuses to accept any kind of logic thrown at him. From the time that he could have killed Aloy during the proving, to the time that he charged Aloy with combat in the ring against a corrupted beast, this dude is stupid. Like all kinds of stupid. He's a masterful general and a skilled combatant, I'm sure. As the leader of the Eclipse and in charge of the Shadow Carja during the Mad Sun King's role, Helis is not someone to fuck around with, and I respect that greatly. But ugh, what a puppet. He's full of life, yet any attempt to swing logic or reason towards his petty little brain is wasted effort. For me, he was hard to like. He was hard to look at and say, yeah man, you're an asshole, and I will defeat you. If anything, Hades, a newly formed AI, is a much better antagonist, silently pulling the strings, corrupting machines via derangement, as well as recognizing that Aloy is a true threat, directing forces and manpowers towards their extinction. That thing knows what's going on. He just confuses me. His choices are mixed between orders of Hades and this mad prophecy. There's this scene where Aloy is about to be dropped into the ring. And he goes on and on about prophecy and destiny among other kinds of fanatical stories. And the option Aloy is shown to confront him with just adds to the sense of frustration. You look at him. Is he insane? Prophecy? Destiny? What is this? What can I say? I don't love Helis. He's a well-designed antagonist from a narrative standpoint. But his role as a puppet is so blatantly obvious you wonder who the blind one is in the room. Final thing I want to touch on here. Questions are answered with more questions. This theme dominates about 60% of your playtime, and it's brilliant because it gives you a reason to explore the world, to delve into the ruins of the cauldrons and the relics of the past. It makes the action you take towards solving the mystery open doors onto how this world came to be and how you, the chosen one, fit into it. The answers you receive during your quests dismiss these floating feelings of uncertainty felt by Aloy and does a pretty decent job of making you, the player, care. I love this theme, and it's a wonderful way to do world building because it provides a good motive of exploration. Just because you made this hyper-realistic open world game does not mean I want to go out and discover every single nook and cranny. Give me a reason as to why I should climb the tall neck or search the cauldron, tightly integrate it into the narrative or the gameplay mechanics, and I'll go out of my way to really push forward. Not every element of the open world game does this well, but the ones that do really keep the player coming back. The combat, what a beast. There are a few elements of the combat really worth talking about here. In a word, it's satisfying. Ever wonder why Hanzo mains exist? It's not because they're trolls or incompetents or any other funny meme that you can conjure up. I bet 8 out of 10 Hanzo mains love Hanzo because everything focuses around the bow. The bow and arrow is one of the most satisfying weapons in video game history. Look at Call of Duty, a game overflowing with futurism and wall running, and the bow and arrow is still in the game because it's that special. You lie in the wait, patiently as you stalk your prey, while computing the angle and shot that you plan to take. The draw of the bow, the release of the string, the silent whir as the quill makes as it zips through the air. The satisfying clink as it lands on the target, unsuspecting and undeterred. It's a gratifying relic treated with major respect and rewards a true steady hand. No one challenges the bow and arrow for its stature, its legacy, and history. It's still an accepted weapon and makes full use of that. Horizon knows this and it embraces this with its lore and its gameplay. Everything you strike initially revolves around the bow. Sure, you can run around whacking some robots left and right with your spear but that will get you nowhere fast. No, the true way to play the game is with the various types of bows and range gear that make your engagements that much more satisfying. And the fact that the bow is really emphasized as the primary tool in this interesting diorama of possible weapons is even better. There is a huge focus of range combat and the satisfaction it brings to the table in terms of engaging the enemies of the game. You are Aloy, a capable human being, but a human being nonetheless. Compared to the behemoths of the Deathbringers and the Thunderjaws, you are but a speck of fragile skin and bone in their arsenal of advanced warfare. So you, as the player, tasked with taking down these monsters with mere sticks and balls, need options, and the world delivers that to you in full swing. From the stealth approach, 
via multiple tall grass sections to the overrides of various robots to commandeer as allies in battle. Horseback is an option to provide more faster and more nimble engagement than your legs can carry you. In the end, you have all these tools to take down these threats. Hell, even your arsenal when creative can apply incredible options to attack, allowing you to assess the situation and set the rules of engagement in your favor. From the slingshot to cause panic and distress, to the tripwire to set traps and disable or secure the threat. Smaller, nimbler bows that trade draw speed for less damage, or larger, sharp shot bows that pack in a considerable punch and precision at the cost of reload time. Combat can only be as engaging as the enemies pitted against you. And here is where Horizon's main draw comes into play. Fighting robot dinosaurs. The variety of machines roaming the world offer various amounts of challenge and creativity in terms of engagement, and the few boss battles against the larger fodder bring something interesting to the table. I will say this, fighting Deathbringers gets a little old after the second engagement, but the battle with the corrupted Thunderjaw and the corrupted Bruiser in the Sun Temple arena are way more interesting. The Bruiser brings this interesting Spanish bullfighting vibe as you dance with death. The way it can pick up speed but fails to turn on a dime, giving you the opportunity to turn the tables, recollect your gear, and take down the machine with fire, much to the dismay of Helis. The Thunderjaw, a bit slower, excels in more ranged engagements, so fighting it on horseback or effectively using cover and sniper shots to play this interesting game of peekaboo. A Deathbringers, these large lumbering tanks filled with advanced warfare, is basically stuck in a holding pattern offering chances to disable the machines as it cycles through its aggressive routines. Cauldron boss fights, which is worried with the ability to override machines to fight on your side, are way more satisfying to complete. Gone is the open world, stealth grass, variable cover, and horseback. It's you and the machine in an arena, gladiator style. Many, many deaths were held in these cauldrons, relying on my speed and strength to kite, disable, and engage these behemoths. But I'd do it all again. The medium machines as well offer some interesting mechanics. Two come to mind, the large robot with the inflated chest area that's just screaming to hit me, and the stalker, a robot that relies solely on turning the tables into its favor and leaving you guessing every time. I enjoyed fighting Big Bird over here, because Big Bird is the one enemy I can always sway into my advantage. Sure, you can pin it, disable it, pop the pouch, but the game has a sense of rewarding curiosity and creativity in the heat of the moment. Using the robot's weak spot against it allows you as Alo to set up some very interesting double kills, provided you're good at controlling the flow of battle. The other enemy worth highlighting is the Stalker. I love the Stalker as a concept, but a side comes up every time I cross into its territory. This stealth equipped, super sensitive hunter does one thing very well that no other enemy can do. It resets the rules of engagement. The common thing with every enemy except for the closed engagement sectors and the stalkers, is that you can engage them on your terms and your rules. Sure, they might have advantages, like the fact that they can fly or they're just insanely tanky, but the world offers you so many options that you can really get crafty and cheesy about how you approach each battle. Not so with the stalker. Once you enter the territory of the stalker, something feels ominous. A presence watching you from the shadows, waiting for a sign to strike. Blinking lights littered across the land, and a sulking, transparent shadow that's hard to pinpoint, that even your focus can't nail down the actual prey, or should I say predator. This is where the fight gets tense. The choices the player makes initially and throughout the battle results in this great tug of war. Who owns the field, and who drives the course of battle? Can you see it? Can it see you? The addition of stealth, as well as the fact that the stalker is a glass cannon, and usually hunts in pairs or groups, according to the several times that I fought it, makes this battle even more interesting from a player's perspective. It's a good test of wit, a tussle of control, and a strain of patience. A well-designed foe, and probably one of my most favorite robots in the game. Hmm? Oh yeah, the humans. So imagine any Ubisoft open world game, but with no guns, slower engagement that rewards stealth rather than arrows blazing, and if you miss a takedown or a critical hit, running to break line of sight in order to reset the engagement or just spam to win. Easily the weakest enemy in the game in terms of designs and engagements.
For as well-rounded, as gratifying as Horizon is as a whole package, there is a slight issue regarding the cohesion, this whole master of none identity. For many things the game builds up and shines in, there are areas where the game falters and stumbles. So let's talk about two of those things, the acronym RPG and what I like to call the Ubisoft effect. A quick wiki search for the acronym RPG or role playing video game tells us that it is a game in which players control the actions of a character or several party members immersed in some well defined world. With the roots of the genre stemming back from tabletop games, the mechanics, rules, and terminology are commonly shared across a variety of media, including complex 3D worlds such as Horizon. Elements from quests to character attributes to progression are all commonplace in most well-defined RPG games. So in truth, this is the first action RPG for Guerrilla Games. It's their first attempt in telling a cohesive story. It's their first attempt at creating a full open world experience. And it's their first attempt at creating a full-blown RPG, complete with progression and player expansion. You assume the role of Aloy, sent to a bunch of main and side quests tied to the immersion of the world, and work to unlock new attributes and increase your overall strength and power via level progression. So what's actually really wrong with it? To be honest, it's just one thing. The death. Horizon has incredible death, most of the time. In the lore, in the weaponry, somewhat, and in the world and all of its secrets, hell, even some of the side quests are some amazing works in terms of what the game can achieve. But once we dive a bit deeper into the RPG elements of the game, that same level of care and quality just isn't really achieved, isn't it? At best, the RPG progression of Horizon reminds me of a game that I adore from head to toe, Faults and Null, and that is Borderlands 2. On the surface level, they're pretty close in terms of design and implementation. Three trees for three different playstyles. As you play, you kill things and you complete objectives. This contributes towards points you used to spend as you upgrade certain abilities. This makes you a stronger foe for the environment, and the environment responds with throwing more and more complex challenges at you. And with this newly minted abilities and weapons, you can solve these challenges in more interesting ways, rather than just chucking grenades and shooting tangos in the face. Alright, so what's the issue? Back to death. Borderlands progression system does one thing really well. It defines the playstyle. Each character has three different classes that define the overall playstyle of the character in question. A balanced class for solo play, a defense support class for group play, and a balls to the wall full offense class for more aggression, high DPS builds and characters. The classes subtly influence the larger decisions you make in terms of prioritizing, progressing, and growth as well as the short-term decision-making concerning loadouts, grenade mods, and passive buffs. The RPG revolves around the progression goal of the player. You can see everything laid out in front of you. You can taste the potential of the final abilities available to each of the players. It builds around a few core mechanics that define your character, their ultimate ability per se. For an FPS, it's a satisfying system that complements to the insanity-fueled nature the game shoves in your face. Every step is exciting. Every new ability unlocked feels well earned. Sure, you can mix and match between abilities to form your own style, but let's be honest here. The cohesion of the three trees to make it work within its own zone really do add to the nature of the game and the experience that it wants to sell you. Horizon, albeit their first, attempts this, and it doesn't quite hit the mark. Each of the three progression trees, Prowler, Brave, and Forager, all do a good job enough of defining the roles for Aloy when it comes to player controlling her actions. What they don't do is help define a playstyle and identity for the player to assume. Look at Path of Exile for example. An unfair comparison, but a game with an incredibly dense progression tree that really does allow for the true player experience and expansion. But more importantly, it defines a playstyle, and that's what's missing here. The Prowler focuses on stealth based attacks and abilities. The Brave is more of a standard combat actions and damage increase, and finally the Forager tree improves health and resource acquisition as well as crafting. This skill tree doesn't set the playstyle of the game, moreover it buffs the playstyle the game kind of forces upon you. Most engagements start with a stealth-like entry, picking off sentries and other high value targets until either you fuck it up or choose to begin the rush. The fight then shifts to a more frantic pace, requiring you to move and shoot. The Brave tree buffs this up with higher damage output, better mobility, and other action-based options. Finally, when your back is against the wall, the Forager tree flexes its muscles, 
optimizing the resources you've collected to keep you alive longer in the fight. Instead of defining the style of play, it augments the core method of play, leaving the feeling of progress kind of lackluster and wanting more. What's to stop me from farming high level robots as well as completing side quests to grind out the skill tree so that the world and its story becomes a breeze? The funny thing is, this is kind of fine. It's a nice start. The game and the world define Aloy's playstyle. The skill tree augments it. The weapons expand upon it. This sparse yet directed tree works fine with the cohesion of the game, even if it doesn't fit the traditional mode. And you know what? I'm cool with breaking the rules from time to time. Quick test for you. Pick an open world Ubisoft game. Any game. Assassin's Creed, The Crew, The Division, it doesn't matter. Now look at the map. See how littered it is with things to do? Massive amounts of collectibles, challenges, quests, and missions for the players to do? All laid out? Now open up Horizon's world map. See what I mean? There is so much stuff to do. Cauldrons, outposts, side quests, main quests, collectibles, hunting challenges, tall necks, spelunking, the list goes on and on. When I play open world games, such as Grand Theft Auto or The Division, these games all suffer from the same trope, bombarding the player with shit to do in hopes that they don't get bored. Whereas other more linear adventure games such as, I don't know, Killzone, that uses a narrative, set pieces, and small trinkets to expand the lore in the world, Ubisoft is especially notorious for doing this, with varying degrees of success. Some activities in games like Assassin's Creed Black Flag and The Division keep the player interested by investing time and effort into the world, mainly in the name of progression and RPG elements. Horizon does this too, where every little activity contributes towards the progression of the player and unlocking more of the skill tree. What I find a little bit disappointing is that almost each element of the world is introduced to the player through a set piece, a main mission or a side quest, or a tutorial brought up by the game. And then that, that's it. It's up to the player to run off and complete the rest of the list. It's a bit lackluster, turning something that benefits the player so much that they feel compelled to do it to a benefit the player has that they have the luxury of doing it or not. The moment where I had the option of doing a side quest for 600 XP and some loot or farming some thunder jaws and snap mobs for the same amount of time that reward me with more interesting components for the weapons that I really want hit me like a brick wall. And that it's wrapped up in a quest that I can pick up from a trader at any time and it's not hard locked by my level? You tell me what's more satisfying. To be honest, I don't have any major gripes with this system. It's effective, but it's common. And the sheer amount of stuff to do never really pushed me to complete events as I stumbled onto them, especially as the story kicked into high gear 70% in. You do have the option before the final boss to go out and prepare by completing side missions, weapon quests, cauldrons, and other world events. But honestly, I'd expect anyone to just finish the story by the time the final battle rolls around and just save that stuff for later. While incredible, this game ain't perfect, not by a long shot. Coming up are a few short remarks I want to address in terms of constructive criticism, as well as some gripes I personally have with the game. I mentioned how the themes of questions with more questions can do a lot for the game in terms of encouraging exploration. Some elements of the world tie in better than others. A great tie-in is the cauldron. Why the hell the cauldron still exists when you stumble upon it one for the first time offers some serious wonder, but also drops some real questions for the player. This increases investment. A bad tie-in is the settlement camp. The settlement camp offers the player to strategically cripple the standing shadow card network of troops and machines, accompanied by an NPC who's had one too many fights to the deaths and actually enjoyed it, it gives off this low-key Far Cry feel that makes the whole process seem a little disjointed from the rest of the experience. What's worse is that you're fighting humans, the least engaging enemy type in the entire game. If you're crafty enough, you don't even have to step foot in the damn can and can eliminate HVTs, sentries, and little fodder with headshots. An alarm mechanic would at least add some tension, forcing the player to move quickly through the shadows and plan out their attacks to avoid raising suspicion. But from the three camps I've liberated so far, I've never felt rushed or had a real sense of urgency. The reward is lackluster compared to the side quests 
which give us some interesting dialogue for world building. Or the cauldrons, would that grant us the power to manipulate the machines of Zero Dawn. The stealth grass is weird. It's incredibly consistent in some areas, and then in other areas it's really not. It's a cool mechanic, which plays into the map design of some closed off arenas of engagement, but otherwise it's woeful and kind of just exists as a means to provide a distinct route. It's a big, shouty safe zone, guaranteeing enemies will not engage you here unless provoked. And because the grass has to look the same regardless of the biome, it sticks out like a sore thumb, especially in the more snow-packed areas. What would have been nice are mechanics that focus a bit more on line of sight, vantage points, in combination with the stealth grass. Hell, even weather to reduce enemy visibility, and pushing the player to rely more on their focus for higher levels of play would have been cool. And on the subject of combat, let's talk about the melee combat. Remember how I talked about the cycle of combat, from a stealthy entry to a more direct engagement with evasion and health as a secondary component of the whole equation? Remember my words of joy of the bow and arrow and the satisfaction it brings? The same cannot be said for the melee combat. Melee combat consists of two phases, stealth combat quick time events and weird combat interactions with varying degrees of success. Melee combat from stealth locks into a set animation once properly executed, but the animation is kind of immersion breaking, especially due to how long the animation lasts, where you execute the animation, and the state of the world post animation where control is handed back to the player. It's a bit better when going for critical hits on down enemies since you're already in the thick of it, but a faster animation for more critical strikes during stealth would have been nice. When melee combat is freed up to the player, we end up with this weird, stupid mess of an interaction. With the lack of lock-on that forces the player to have time to swing the way Alo is facing and the impending threat who has breached her personal space. This sometimes leads to wacky swings that pulls the player out of combat for so long and leaves Aloy wide open and suspecting to devastating blind size and punishment. The damage is weak for both heavy and light swings. Even if the player increases the potency on the skill tree, it de-emphasizes the use of melee combat in close quarter situations and relying more on your ranged weapons as well as running for cover. You can't even upgrade it, unlike all the other weapons in the game. One idea, instead of a spear, would be a knife. I'd have to research it lore-wise, but a knife would be a better role for the areas where melee combat excels in, that being in stealth and overrides. Faster animation for robots and humans, less immersion breaking, and a better defined role in gameplay. But that's just my two cents. To add to the world, the tribal politics had so much going for it. It really did. I hate to say this, but the story was incredibly obsessed with Aloy, and everything revolved around her so much, it's as if the rest of the world's problems took a major backseat to the mystery surrounding her and Zero Dawn. In terms of dialogue and character chat wheels, we learned the basics of the Shadow Karja and Nora tribes, with the rest locked away in text box for the players to sit back and read. If I learned anything from playing Destiny, not many people read this stuff. A rich world begging to be explored, pulled from the focal point in the place of a personal story of growth, mystery, and identity. If anything, it made me read. I just wish it was better ingrained in the world, like how the audio logs are. And finally, on the subject of audio logs, they're wonderful but inconsistent. They give great exposition, but are easily cut off by the present world. In order to really understand the full experience, you have to stop, put the controller down, and listen. It bucks the pace of the game. Moving into a new room or climbing on an elevator shaft has a chance to trigger dialogue from Aloy or Silence, cutting off the narration of the old world, leaving the player confused, frustrated, and having to dig back through the menus to hear it again, or be left wondering what Aloy just remarked on. For reviews of games, instead of relying on a number or some kind of arbitrary scale, I'll say this instead. Buy the game. Complete the story. Take them time to explore the world and do a few activities and side quests, especially the cauldrons, which in my opinion offer a way better reward than the settlement camp liberation. This game is worth the full asking price of $60 for the PlayStation 4. Hell, for some people, this game convinces people to buy a PlayStation 4, adding to an already killer library. If you have a PS4, buy this game. If you have a PS4 Pro, you already have this game. If you don't have a PlayStation 4 yet, you have a decision to make. A fairly easy one I'll attest to. This game is very much worth the praise and hype surrounding it. I'd buy DLC for this game, that's how much I like it. Bravo Sony and Gorilla.
Too bad everything got overshadowed by the Juggernaut that is Legend of Zelda a week later. Aloy may not be the Juggernaut female lead on the same level as Samus Aran or Lara Croft, but I suspect that she soon will be one of the greats. I want to thank you for watching my video. This is a New Year's resolution turned into a passion project. This, hopefully, is the first of many. You can find me on Twitter at the Domus Project for channel specifics, such as new videos and when I go live on Twitch, and Tenji to Furo for other stuff. Speaking of Twitch, you can find me on twitch.tv at Domus877, and right here on YouTube. Stay tuned to those channels to learn more about the content I'm planning on doing.